In this video, we will derive the Landé g-factor, named after the German physicist Alfred Landé. In fact, we will show you two ways to derive it, first quick and easy, and then mathematically rigorous. First off, let's talk about how we use g-factors. In atomic physics, a g-factor plays a role in determining the energy levels of an atom in a magnetic field, for example described by the Zeeman effect. A charged particle, which has angular momentum, whether it be orbital angular momentum or spin, carries a magnetic moment. This magnetic moment can generally be written as a g-factor, a magneton, and the corresponding angular momentum. A g-factor depends on the kind of a particle, as well as the type of angular momentum. So if we consider an electron, for example, and orbital angular momentum, gl is equal to 1. On the other hand, the magneton only depends on the species of the particle, since it involves charge and mass. For instance, if we take an electron and a positron, their magnetons are given by these expressions, which we can abbreviate by the so-called Bohr magneton. Now, if an atom is exposed to a magnetic field, we get an additional term in the Hamiltonian, a potential energy term minus mu times b. So if a particle has orbital angular momentum and spin, it has both a mu l and a mu s, which can be written like this. However, we know that in a weak magnetic field, l and s couple to a total angular momentum j, so that we could assume that the magnetic moment is now given by a different g-factor and j. And this gj is the Landé g-factor. So the question is now, what's the value for gj for a given particle? In the course of this video, we will find an expression for gj, which will depend on gl, gs, l, s, and j. Since gl and gs are particle-specific and lsj specify the state of the wave function, the Landé g-factor will depend both on the kind of the particle and the quantum numbers of the wave function. Now that we have set up all necessary equations, let's start the derivations. For simplicity, we will always use a magnetic field which points in the z-direction. For the first derivation, we start with the following ansatz. Instead of GLL plus GSS, we want the magnetic moment to be given by GJJ. Let's start by multiplying this equation by J. This means we have inner products of L times J and s times j on the left. Here we can use a trick to get rid of those terms. We know that l plus s gives j, but we can also write this as j minus s equals l and j minus l equals s. If we square these equations, we get expressions for the inner products that we can substitute. This leads to an equation with only l squared, s squared and j squared. We can now replace those by their expectation values and divide by h bar squared j j plus 1. Therefore, this equation is not applicable in the case that j is 0. But since for j equals 0 the energy shift vanishes anyway, it does not matter what value gj has in that case. With this, we get the final expression for the Landé g-factor, which, as promised, depends on gl, gs, as well as l, s and j. In the case of an electron, we can use the electron-specific values for gl and gs, and also use s equals one half, which yields a much more simple equation. However, there is a slight problem with our ansatz here. l plus s equals j, but if gl and gs are not both equal to one, the vector on the left is not parallel to j anymore. So how can we improve this derivation? Let's start the second derivation without any assumptions. We know that an external magnetic field leads to an additional potential energy in the Hamiltonian, given by minus mu times b. Since we assume b to be small, we can use perturbation theory to get the energy shift. The first order correction to the energy levels is given by evaluating the potential between the states of the wave function, which are given by j, mj, l, s. Again, this is a weak magnetic field which allows for LS coupling. For the case of a strong magnetic field, you can find more information in our video on the Paschenbach effect. Let us continue. By using the expressions from above, we get the energy shift to be equal to mu b times bz 
over h bar times the expectation value of GLLZ plus GSSZ in the state JMJLS. However, LZ and SZ do not have well-defined eigenvalues anymore, since they are now coupled to the total angular momentum J. So instead of L and S, we can use their time-averaged expressions, which means first projecting them onto the direction of J, and then multiplying this quantity with a unit vector in the direction of J. Since this unit vector is just J divided by its length, we can also write those expressions like this. The reason why we might do this is that we can now evaluate the operators inside the bracket expressions by replacing the inner products of J times L and J times S, like in the previous derivation. However, we don't want to take the time average expressions for L and S for granted. Instead, let's find out why those time averaged expressions occur. So let's go back to the expression for the energy shift. Since B is a constant, we can write it outside. What remains is a matrix element of the magnetic moment vector. At this point, we can use the powerful wigner eckert theorem to guide us. In particular, in case of a vector operator, we can use a special case of the wigner eckert theorem called the projection theorem. Since this video is already quite long, we prove the projection theorem in another video. So here's what it states. If we want to evaluate the matrix element of a general vector operator A between states of equal J, but not necessarily equal M, this can be written as the matrix element of A times J between the states JM, divided by H bar squared and J times J plus one, and the matrix element of angular momentum between those initial states. This projection theorem gives us a mathematically rigorous way to evaluate the matrix elements of LZ and SZ, even though we are now dealing with LS coupling, so we cannot simply use their eigenvalues, ML or MS. In fact, after applying the projection theorem, you can see the resemblance to the time averaged angular momenta from the previous derivation. By replacing the inner products of L and S with J, like before, we can let all operators act on the cat states and get the same expression for the Landé G factor valid in first order perturbation theory. And that's pretty much it for this video. Thanks for watching.